Welcome to the iWest seminar series. My name is Andrea Maestas. I'm part of the iWest team at Los Alamos National Lab, and I'll be your host for today. I'll start with a brief introduction to iWest for anyone who may be joining for the first time. So iWest is an initiative funded by the US Department of Energy to provide communities across six Intermountain West states with data tools and information for energy transition planning. iWest takes a place-based approach, which frames everything we do in the context of the geographical, environmental, and demographic attributes of the Intermountain West region. We also take a technology neutral approach that explores energy options and opportunities across numerous symbiotic energy economies. And those technologies are assessed in tandem with societal readiness, which we believe is key to ensuring an equitable energy transition. And those assessments are all done through community engagement and coalition building to encourage regional partnerships. Today's seminar is on the topic of water, which we all know is a critical factor in regional energy transition, particularly in the arid Mountain West. But today we're discussing um, water as a basic need and the enormous challenge many residents on the Navajo Nation are facing to get clean, uh, safe water for drinking, cleaning, and agriculture. So it's my privilege to introduce you to our speaker today, Dr. Abhishek Roy Chowdhury, who is one of the leaders of the Navajo Nation Water Purification Project. Through this project, he and his colleagues are working to develop technologies to address this water challenge on the Navajo Nation. He's an associate professor of environmental science and natural resources at Navajo Technical University with expertise in environmental cleanup and has received over $5 million in grants from federal and non-federal sources since 2020. He's um, the elected secretary and treasurer of the Ge Geology and Health Division of the Geological Society of America. He serves as associate editor of iGEST and is an academic editor for PLOS Water. Dr. Roy Chowdhury is the recipient of multiple awards and recognitions. Most recently, he was named a USDA 2023 Tribal Science Fellow. And so thank you so much for being here, Dr. Roy Chowdhury. Um, we're so happy to have you and to learn about this important project. So with that, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Andrea. And again, thank you everyone uh, for being here today. Um, like, you know, it's, uh, it's been a pleasure for me to introduce or like, you know, some of you have heard about this project, but I will like, you know, I'll be happy to share uh, all the like an you know, aspect of this project. So uh, the title of the talk today is Restore uh, in Navajo, like, you know, so is water. So we are today we are going to talk about uh, a project where through which uh, we are restoring vital water resources on the Navajo Nation. Uh, as Andrea mentioned, uh, my name is Abhishek Rajchaudhary, and uh, I have been associated with Navajo Technical University for uh, last five years. So I joined here as an assistant professor and recently I became an associate professor of environmental science and natural resources. And it's my privilege to not only uh, serve into students, but also like, you know, this is one of a few opportunities where an academician can uh, directly work with the community. And uh, that's the like you know, story I'm bringing uh, from Navajo Nation to all of you today. Uh, next slide, please. All right, just uh, like you know, before starting, uh, like you know, about telling you about the project, I just wanted to give a small overview of Navajo Technical University itself. So, uh, NTU is one of the 35 uh, tribal universities uh, in the US. So we are often known as TCUs. So uh, we have 95% uh, students who are associated or like, you know, one way or other, uh, they're Native American. And we are like, you know, we follow DNA philosophy of education. So that means like, you know, culture is an integral part of our uh, education system. and. Although being a science like you know educator myself, 
uh, this is a very important uh, task that we follow that how you can like, you know, make students more attentive by talking about their culture and how relevant, like, you know, basically I'm an environmental science uh, faculty. So how, why it is important to take care of their own community, the environment overall. So the picture you are seeing on the right is uh, uh, a schematic diagram of DPE or DNA philosophy of education. So in its case, uh, it, means, it means introduction, like, you know, uh, Nahata is methods, Ina is results, and Sihasin is reflection. So it's like, you know, we always go clockwise. And also four different color uh, in this picture is basically representation of the color of the sky throughout like, you know, 24 hour cycle. So uh, from, white to blue to like you know yellow to black so this is how uh, our daily lives also circle around so uh, if we, we if we can think whatever we are doing even if it is a research uh, uh, if we just follow that like you know follow our heart and follow everything that is being uh, that we are surrounded by so it's always help us to guide uh, through different difficult uh, processes as well next slide please so uh, we started, NTU started as Navajo Skill Center in 1979. Then in 1985, we became Crown Point Institute of Technology. Uh, 2006, we became Navajo Technical College. And in 2013, we became Navajo Technical University. So we are the first university established on Navajo Nation. Uh, our main campus is in Crown Point, New Mexico. But we have all together, we have five campuses. So Kirtland, Zuni, beside Crown Point are in New Mexico and Chinle and uh, Tees are in Arizona. So uh, we, we serve the entire Navajo Nation by spreading out. Uh, next slide, please. And while talking about Navajo Nation, this is the largest Native American tribe in the US, uh, 270,000 square miles of area. Uh, we, we are like, you know, by size wise, we are equivalent to the state of West Virginia, but it's now our land is actually larger than 10 out of uh, 50 states uh, in the US. And it, uh, next slide, please. And as you can um, see in this picture, uh, it is uh, arid, uh, like, you know, uh, desert land, uh, average, uh, this, like, you know, distance from sea level is 7,000 feet all across Navajo Nation, but it is rich in his, history and culture. So Monument Valley, uh, Winter Rock, like, you know, some of those, like, you know, very attractive tourist, uh, like, you know, sports also are within Navajo Nation. Next slide, please. But uh, on the other hand, uh, it is sad, but true that 30% of the homes uh, on Navajo Nation do not have access to running water. So all the black dots you are seeing in this picture are those homes. That means uh, like you know, even if you open your tap, there is no water coming out. So only way that you can get your water is you have to go out and haul. And I have a few pictures down there, like you know, a few slides later on to show you how people like you know do that. But again, this is um, within the US and we are talking about places where people do not have water. So for us, like, you know, for Navajo people, water, uh, like, you know, uh, although it's a, like, you know, basic human right, but they do not have access to that. So Navajo households are 19 times more likely than white households to be without running water. So that's the, like, you know, uh, dire consequences we are talking about, even like, you know, uh, in today's time. Next slide, please. So uh, just to understand the problem, like, you know, uh, we, uh, we always like, you know, talk about climate change. So this is, so now our nation is uh, in the receiving end of climate change um, in other way. So US drought monitor or USDM, uh, they started monitoring uh, drought condition throughout US since 2000. And we have data for now our nations uh, like, you know, drought condition uh, till like, you know, since 2000 as well. And as you can see in this picture, which is as current as 2023 uh, April, the Navajo Nation throughout the last two decades, uh, uh, they are always in one way or other in drought condition. So, 
And most recently, uh, now our nation is going through either D3 or D4, which are the extreme drought like in you know, a condition. So we cannot like in you know, a change climate, right? So we, we have no uh, control over the precipitation. So that's the natural causes, but that's not the only one. So next slide, please. So another problem uh, for like, you know, Navajo Nation's water uh, scarcity is like, you know, mining. So Navajo Nation have been through uh, like, you know, long and extensive mining history. So mining started on Navajo Nation in mid 1800s with gold, copper, lead and silver. Then uranium mining started uh, in early 1900s and coal mining started in 1960s. And just a few years back, uh, now Onishan closed down their last uh, operational coal mine uh, within its boundary. But what the problem is with like, you know, just by looking at those years, you can easily identify that most of the mining happened before like, you know, any stricter mining laws were implemented uh, in the US. So we have a like, you know, number of abundant mines, be it coal, uh, mineral or uranium all across now our nation. And those abundant mines, because they were not properly uh, remediated and for some of the uranium sites, they were not properly capped, they're active source of environmental pollution. So we have elevated levels of metals resulted from this mining activities in groundwater uh, in our nation and surface water as well. So there are unregulated wells and springs, which has high level of like, you know, metal contamination as well. Uh, next slide, please. So, and this is like, you know, uh, if you take a tour of Navajo Nation, you will see uh, these windmills. So uh, windmills are like, you know, wind turbines, which are pumping groundwater and uh, storing them in the storage tanks. But the problem is when you see a windmill with the inscriptions, like uh, one of the bottom, like in a picture, uh, that warning water is not safe for drinking or cooking only for livestock use, that tells you that this water is contaminated. And that's the reason that most of these windmills are impaired. So that means people cannot drink it. So although uh, we are telling them that you can use it for livestock and people are using those water uh, for that purposes, but one thing we are ignoring that those some of those livestock are part of our food cycle as well. So if we are exposing the livestock with like you know metal contaminated water it's actually coming to us so there are few studies published papers out there that show that how blood uh, like you know uh, metal levels are higher in navajo communities uh, but that's not the part of today's discussion so and alternatively what you have to do you have to go out and haul water so uh, next slide please so hauling water means you have to carry this like in you know, a water containers and you have to drive to your nearest regulated water like you know sources sometimes it will be your chapter house sometimes it will be some other places and sometimes you have to pay to like you know get this water but on the other hand when you when we are talking about water hauling for some communities it can like you know it can the nearest regulated water sources can be 30 40 miles away from their home. So you are like, you know, you're spending money on gas and also you are investing your time to haul water. Now, based on your like, you know, number of heads of your family, and also if you are like, and if you have livestock based, based on their number as well. So now you multiply those many number of trips weekly. So water hauling is not only inconvenient, time taking, but it's also expensive for now people. But again, this is the daily life. So I have students in my classes who do water hauling uh, like in every week, few times every week. And I have some students, they although they have water in their places, but they do uh, water hauling for their like you know, grandparents over the weekend. So the students we are we work with here at NTU, they are from the community. So they know the issues, how real it is. And, and that's why we started like, you know, this project. So next slide, please. And just to give you an idea, so our group uh, created this map with the help of Navajo Water Resources and all the doors you are see. So Navajo Nation basically uh, divided into five agencies, Eastern Agency, Western Agency, Fort, uh, Fort Defiance, Chinle, and Shiprock. And within those five agencies, there are 110 chapters. 
So chapters work like municipality. They have elected officials and every chapter has their boundary and like, you know, and their specific population. But all the dots you are seeing in this map are those livestock wells. And just to like, you know, refresh your memory, can you just click one more time? And this is what livestock wells looks like. So uh, they're pumping groundwater, which is not uh, safe for human consumption, but they're out there. So over 770 livestock that we mapped and uh, they exist. So, and even during the time of COVID, people ended up drinking this water because for them, going to the nearest uh, regulated water source were not uh, possible at that time. And sometimes, like, you know, they have no other choice. So people are drinking those water, although we are not, like, you know, uh, we, we have all this warning sign because that's their last resort uh, for their whole community. And again, these are groundwater contaminated with uh, heavy metals and metalloids. Next slide, please. And we, like, you know, we access few maps from Navajo AML's website, and this map shows you, uh, like, you know, existing, like, you know, abundant coal mine, uh, copper, other mineral uranium mines. And as you can see, they're spread across Navajo Nation along those chapter lines. Next slide, please. And this is the map of abundant uranium mines across Navajo Nation. And again, if you superimpose those maps with those uh, uh, like, you know, livestock wells, you will see they're kind of like, you know, uh, very close to those mines, which are like, you know, uh, actively polluting water both groundwater surface water so those uh, like you know uh, wells are have this active source of contamination next slide please and this is a us epa map uh, all the red dots are homes within one mile uh, like you know uh, distance from abundant uranium mines and the black dots are black and yellow dots are the homes without water so again just to give you that overview that there are abundant mines everywhere. There are livestock wells that are pumping groundwater, which is contaminated with mine wastes. And these are the water that uh, now our people uh, are using for their livestock management and sometimes for their uh, personal drinking as well. So next slide, please. So uh, that Dine philosophy of education that I just started with. So that was our like an introduction, Nitsaha case. Now I will like, you know, enter into the like, you know, Nahata part, like, you know, what are the methods that we are using? So we launched uh, our project, NTUNMT Nava Nation Water Purification Project, and our acronym is N4WPP in 2020 uh, in the midst of COVID pandemic. And uh, Two universities, Navajo Technical University and New Mexico Tech, uh, we came together and, like you know, we started this uh, uh, this collaboration. And the theme of our project is restore. So in Navajo is water. So that, like you know, the core message for our project is how we can restore vital water resources of Navajo Nation. As I mentioned, we have no control over climate change. We have no control over like you know how much precipitation Navajo Nation will receive this year or next year. But what we can do, our nations still have groundwater, although they're contaminated, but those resources are there. So through this project, we like, you know, we are targeting how we can clean those groundwater and we can give it to the community. So at least they can, uh, like, you know, they can utilize that. So we have a website and you guys can all, you guys are always welcome to like, you know, check uh, the status of that. So next slide, please. So again, N4WPP is a joint endeavor to install water filtration, like, you know, facilities across Navajo Nation. And through, because again, whenever two universities are partnering, that means uh, this project has a huge student training and student, like, you know, uh, uh, student oriented uh, outcomes. And we, we were fortunate to have our industry partner, PESCO, so they are based in Farmington. So uh, in like, you know, in having them on board, we are able to deploy the field deployable filtration unit. So uh, because for any drinking water purposes, uh, you need US EPA certification, which is a like, you know, time taking uh, process. So initially we are claiming that this water is safe for livestock use and irrigation and your like, you know, other purposes. And eventually, once we'll get the USCPA permit, 
we will like you know uh, we'll tell communities that this is safe for drinking but i will show you like you know through our uh, lab studies we saw that this filtration unit can uh, achieve those drinking water uh, standards as well so next slide please so uh, New Mexico Tech actually developed this technology. So uh, their Petroleum Recovery Research Center, or PRRC, uh, and Dr. Jinjia Yu uh, is the inventor of this uh, direct, uh, like, you know, hollow fiber membrane-based direct contact distillation process, or the CMD. So uh, New Mexico Tech being a research university, so they have infrastructure, so they developed this filter even before COVID. So, and they were using it for uh, produce water filtration. So when COVID hit and we were like, you know, going through that phase, so they reached out to us and they asked us like, you know, can we use this filter to treat groundwater for now our nation? Because that's again, the community really need that. And we being a TCU and being part of Navajo Nation, we have that like, you know, access. So we can like, you know, uh, help them access to the community. So that's how this joint venture started. And like, you know, after three years, like, you know, from, from that initiation, we are really on a very, like, you know, good ground. And uh, we, we are proud to say that this process project is like, you know, thriving uh, right now. So the whole idea, was we knew that this filtration system can filter out salt. Salinity is a big problem for Navajo Nation and like, you know, nutrients and other metals. So uh, we started with that and next slide, please. So this is like, you know, uh, the left uh, picture is the hollow fiber membrane. So it's like, you know, uh, it's like hair, human hair and right side pictures are the microscopic view. So as you can see, like, you know, the membrane, how it looks like uh, under microscope. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the whole process is uh, that we need to uh, warm up the contaminated water. And I will talk about the heating requirement as well, just in a bit. So, and the, when we are, uh, we have this genus, double membrane hollow fiber uh, like you know filtration units so only steam can cross the filters and everything else all the other contaminant and salt they get concentrated and they uh, exited through the other side of the like you know of the system so in that case we eliminate the clogging issues because nothing else is crossing the filter so there is no clogging or fouling uh, that we see in other type of membrane. So this membrane is a uh, double layer. So the green part is the uh, hydrophilic, like an outer surface, and the uh, like you know the blue part is the hydrophobic. So in that case, we were really able to uh, like you know uh, use this technology, and this steam gets like you know uh, get to other end of the filtration unit, and we can get. Uh, all the salt rejection and metal rejection from the whole system. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, so again, all these tests were conducted at PRRC at New Mexico Tech. So they like you know ran this filtration uh, system uh, and they did like in you know, a short term, like you know long term uh, experiments and with like you know uh, and they received 99.99 percent salt rejection like, you know, throughout the time. So again, we are using dual layer genus uh, hollow fiber membrane, and which is like, you know, always better than the other uh, hollow fiber membrane that we have uh, in the market. So next slide, please. And the cost wise, because we have to like, you know, uh, heat the water. So heat is the main cost. So once, so for our, all our experimental, like, you know, purposes, we use propane. So this is just because we wanted to test the filtration unit is working or not. And that like, you know, bring the cost up to 87 cents for uh, PBL. But what we are doing now, we are like, you know, we are in the process of changing, like, you know, heat source from propane to solar. And that will bring down the cost to 10 cents uh, for PBL. So, Again, uh, like, you know, we are in the, like, you know, uh, modification process. And first first of all, we wanted to see that if it will work or not for Navajo Nation water. And then now we are making all those modifications. So next slide, please. 
And again, uh, we ran this filter like you know constantly for uh, for hours. And this picture when the TDS was equivalent to seawater, 35,000 mg per liter, and we see that again the salt rejection was like you know 90 over 99 percent, and it never clogged. Then we went one step further. And next slide, please. And we ran water, which has way higher TDS than even seawater. And I will tell why we needed to do that just in a bit. Uh, so this time the TDS was 155,000 uh, mg per liter. And again, we got the same salt rejection over 99.9%. And the flux never like you know, dropped. That means there was no clogging. So again, with this, like, you know, uh, with these experiments, we knew that the filtration system is going to work in the field. Next slide, please. And then we ran the actual water from Navajo Nation. And as you can see on the uh, left-hand picture or left-hand graph, that's the TDS of Navajo Nation water, which is over 50,000 mg per liter, where US EPA drinking water standard for TDS is 500 mg per liter. And when we ran that water through our system, filtration system, we saw the TDS came down at 17 mg per liter, way below the US EPA uh, drinking water standard. And the right-hand pictures, they are showing the heavy metal uh, in the water. So again, this is real water from Navajo Nation. Uh, arsenic, chromium, lead, selenium, uranium, everything was uh, like, you know, removed almost by 100%, like, you know, uh, before and after the filtration system. So again, this is our lab study. So once we once we like you know got this result, so we knew that uh, we are ready. We are ready for field deployment. So uh, next slide, please. But the first thing, uh, the first challenge, although like you know, you can have a best technology, right? In uh, developed in lab. So the trickiest part is how you are going to bring it to the community where they really need it. And when those communities are Native American communities, there are so many other uh, like you know factors you need to uh, like you know you need to uh, be aware of. And that's why NTU came into uh, the play. So because again, remember we are part of Navajo Nation and our students are from those community. So we started a plan. So we like you know uh, and we we kept our students in the forefront. So right now they are working with. Uh, the N4WPP uh, team members. And now we are first uh, identifying the sites. Uh, the whole idea is over the next five years, we want to install 10 filtration units uh, with 500 uh, gallon, uh, like, you know, uh, per day filtration capability all across Navajo Nation. You guys just saw the map. It's a huge area. We cannot cover everywhere. And we are targeting, first of all, the communities they're, where they have really bad water and like they're far from the regulated sources so that at least they have access to some alternative uh, options. So site selection is the key and our students are like, you know, going with us in the field. And I will tell you like, you know, it's, it's not also easy just to go out there and start collecting. So I'm coming to that process just in a way, but that's the first step site selection. So next slide please. Then, because we are installing a water filtration unit, we have to, like, you know, get the required permit. We have to have, like, you know, installation and monitoring plan in place. And we, like, we are working with uh, Navajo uh, Water Resources. Then, like, you know, uh, in the permitting process, we'll be working with Navajo Nation EPA and US EPA as well. So, but on the other hand, students are getting this, like, you know, hands on uh, experiences, how to get involved in all the aspects of permitting, installation, operation, maintenance, and monitoring. So that's our second step. Uh, next slide, please. And the long-term goal is that we want to hand over these filtration units to the community for free. But remember, it's not only what we are handing over, but we have to train the community member how they can maintain and like you know, uh, address some of the issues that might arise. So educating educating the community members is also another key aspect of this project. So our students first they're getting that all the training from engineering to designing to permitting and maintenance, and then they will be go out they will be going out to the community to train community members. And I will like you know talk just in a bit how that like you know process works as well. So 
again uh, so after installation our goal is to like you know monitor it and maintain it for the community for like you know next two years after installation and then we'll transfer the ownership to the community for free but again during that time our students will be training them so they are confident how to like you know, maintain those systems so uh, while doing so we want to uh, develop a trained uh, workforce in the field of water on our nation uh, next slide please and local workforce building is key uh, we have uh, like you know a great need for uh, trained uh, personnel to run all those like you know uh, uh, offices in our nation as well and uh, because local students are being trained in database management water sampling and analysis and unit operation so they are going to be part of this local workforce down the road and this is how we are augmenting class classroom learning with uh, like you know actual hands-on training in the field and also we have a broader picture in mind so we want to create an education model so now our uh, tech we are an undergrad like you know degree granting institution but we have uh, dual credit students that means high school students like you know take some of those college level courses with us so we want to engage them from their high school times uh, through these projects and then they will come to NTU to complete their undergrad study and because we have a great partner as an MT who are a research university and a graduate like you know degree granting university those students after getting their undergrad degree they can always go there so it's like you know they're getting a full circle educational like you know uh, degree and then they can always come back and serve now our nation so that's the like you know educational component of this project next slide please so again Remember, these students are uh, Native American students. It's the first time they're uh, like, you know, doing something, some hands-on, uh, they're getting hands-on training. So uh, for them, this is not only the education that they're getting. Also, they're like, you know, for them, because they are from those community, they're serving their community. So they are trying to become a solution of those problems that they have like you know grew up with and so again we are taking them to the field uh, they are learning how to like you know do fill uh, monitor like you know uh, testing uh, they are learning how to collect samples how to bring them back properly like you know after storing and analyzing them using the instruments and also once the data is they are generating how to make sense out of those data so they are getting all those hands-on training through this project next slide please and as i mentioned a key component if you want to bring any project for any native american community the main like you know aspect of that uh, like you know of that project should be how you can work with the community so for now our nation as i mentioned uh, now our nation has 110 chapters so even if you want to go and test one of those livestock wells from any particular chapter, you cannot just go there and like you know collect sample. Even uh, being from Navajo Technical University, we do not have that permission. So the first thing we need to do, we need to get permission from those chapters, and we call them as resolution, chapter resolution. So one picture you can see on on left hand uh, corner of the slide. So again just to get this resolution i have to be there i have to like you know uh, be there multiple times i have to present this uh, uh, this project to the community in layman's term and uh, i don't speak navajo so i always take students from those community who are fluent in navajo so that they can translate uh, to the community member then there will be like you know open question answer session and if there are any like you know concern we will go back and we'll address them and then only we can get this resolution uh, approved by the chapter. So once we have the resolution passed, then only we can go out there and start collecting uh, water samples, analyze them, do the site selection. So this is a like you know uh, uh, time taking steps, but this is the right step to take. So and this is how community also know that you are really there for them. It's not like another project where lot of lots of promises are being made and nothing is being delivered for the community so 
uh, we don't want to be those groups. So we really want to be there for the community and want to do something good. And whenever they're seeing their own, like, you know, uh, students from those community, they are part of this project and they are advocating for this project. So they have the trust. So it's kind of a trust building mechanism as well that we are uh, following. And, uh, and like, you know, I can proudly say that that, uh, like, you know, mechanism is working really, really great. And we can always take out to any of, beyond Navajo Nation, any other tribal communities, because it's the right thing to uh, tell them upfront what we are doing, why we are there, like, you know, what we want to uh, deliver and how the community will be benefited. And not only that, we are also, like, you know, involving Navajo Nation administration. So, uh, like, you know, we go and we present our uh, project in front of different Navajo Nation committees. So one picture is uh, on the right hand side is when I was presenting in front of uh, RDC, Research and Development Committee. So uh, Navajo Nation's newly elected vice president, she really support our project. So uh, she, because she saw how motivated our students are. So uh, she kind of like, you know, opened her office for us and our students are always welcome. And she is really like, you know, supporting our project as well, because we are there, we are there for last three years and we we, we haven't left. And uh, so those are the community, like, you know, uh, viewpoint they're seeing uh, our project uh, from as well. So next slide, please. And because our students are part of, integral part of this project, and not only they are getting those community, like, you know, outreach uh, training, but they are also gaining all those, and because they are learning stuff, so they are gaining the academic knowledge as well. So they are getting trained on public outreach. So they are going out there, they are presenting their work in different conferences, and uh, like, you know, they're really like, you know, doing great. So some of our students have already completed their undergrad degrees, and they are uh, like, you know, in different universities for their grad, like, you know, studies. So again, we are really like, you know, proud of our students because they took this project as like, you know, uh, as a priority. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, other public outreach components that we have is like, you know, uh, so we participate in uh, many outreach activities in Navajo Nation communities. We are attending chapter house meetings. We are educating members for water quality, and we want to foster the importance of a common Navajo saying to a ina, which is water is life. And every year, uh, we uh, we are hosting an N4WPP water symposium. So last year, like you know, it was held at Farmington High School, and. Uh, so like, you know, we had a really like, you know, good response from the high school students. And next slide, please. And this is the flyer for our this year's water symposium, which is going to happen on uh, November 3rd at UNM Gallup campus. And like, you know, you all are invited. So there is a QR code. You can have more information uh, uh, about the symposium. Uh, we have uh, opportunity for all of you to be there as a like you know participant. We need judges. We need mentors. So because this time we are expecting around 100 high school students across Navajo Nation. So we have like you know uh, great partners who are like you know reaching out to the schools. So we already gave them water challenge, and they are going to work with their uh, science uh, teacher to come up with the solution. And they're making videos, and during the symposium, they're going to pitch their solution. There will be like you know water experts who will be like you know uh, reviewing them, and then they will get awards. Uh, so it's kind of like you know not only we are trying to spread the awareness uh, around water issues, but we also want our students to get engaged starting from high school. So again, uh, our next water symposium is just like you know a few weeks from now, and you all are like you know welcome to join us uh, next slide please so this are some of the pictures from last year water symposium so as you can see high school students they were pitching their solution so they came up with really interesting solution about like you know, how we can treat now our nation water and uh, next slide please and these are the winners of last year's and they receive uh, scholarship from universities and that's why we also need sponsors 
for this symposium so that we can keep on encouraging students to come to uh, like you know colleges because as you know that uh, Native American student uh, in STEM disciplines the overall percentage is really low so this is like you know different ways we are approaching they can be like you know motivated they can be like you know uh, uh, like you know, engaged with some of the community work and uh, then they can like you know serve uh, in different roles down the road. Uh, next slide, please. And we we convened some panels. So people talked about their experience, their journey as like, you know, uh, water professionals. We have many universities, many Navajo Nation agencies who like, you know, uh, had their booth and we have a like, you know, a really good and interacting uh, sessions. So again, this is just what we have done last year. Uh, next slide, please. And because we are talking about water uh, of Navajo Nation, and we have to make sure that we are following Navajo Nation's data sovereignty policies. And that's why for this project, we are preparing a database management platform. And uh, so the whole idea is all the water data that we'll be collecting, and we are already collecting, and they will be stored, and public can access that, but through a process it's not like you know we are uh, like you know just doing whatever we want to do with the data so we again we are following all the steps that should be taken uh, because it's a sovereign nation and we have to uh, make sure that we are not violating any law so we have great partners beside those two universities so we have intera integral consulting and uh, uc berkeley based west big data innovation hub who are training our students and who are helping us to develop this database management platform. And this platform will be hosted on NTU, like, you know, uh, online portal, so that, like, you know, this will be owned by Navajo Nation, uh, not by any other, like, you know, entities outside Navajo Nation. So again, we are just the whole idea is we wanted to, like, you know, do everything right uh, from the beginning. And, like, you know, students are part of this database management uh, as well. So they are getting that hands-on experience as well. So next slide, please. And uh, I'm happy to say like, you know, our first uh, field deployable unit uh, that was developed by PESCO, uh, it got installed at NTU campus uh, this summer. And because the whole idea was because our students need to get those hands-on training. So they know how we are uh, preparing the filtration unit in the lab, how like, you know, tests are being done. But this is not about lab. This is how we are going to take the units out in the field, so the communities will have these units, and um, uh, how how like you know different maintenance operational protocols need to be followed. So uh, we we have installed this one. So this is ready uh, for training. And next week we are going to get uh, our our own uh, training from uh, engineers from PESCO, and then our students will like you know keep. Uh, running this unit and uh, like you know uh, will be for this particular one because we are not installing it beside a, a specific well so we will be bringing water from different like you know communities from where we already received our permission uh, through those resolutions so we'll be bringing those water we'll be running this like you know filtration unit and we'll be like you know we'll be monitoring so this is another you know way to train our students and how they can like you know better understand this uh, this whole system because then they will go out and they will uh, train those uh, community members as well uh, next slide please and uh, again i'm happy to report that uh, two weeks ago we received uh, environmental justice grant from uh, doe's legacy management office so it's their minority serving institutions uh, EJ grant and our project was selected to like, you know, uh, to carry forward this project. And we will be like, you know, through this grant, we will be able to roll out this filtration unit, uh, the community. So we're already working uh, to like, you know, set up the grant. So we already have a really like, you know, uh, dedicated team. We have a plan. So like, you know, this is our time to go out there and like, you know, start uh, the world, uh, like, you know, real world work. So that's next. And we are really excited for this, like, you know, for this grant. And this will really help not only us, not only the group, 
but also the community in need. Uh, so that's next. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, with that, like, you know, I cannot like, you know, uh, end this presentation without acknowledge, acknowledging like, you know, many uh, folks. So first of all, a big thank to iWest for giving uh, me to present our project uh, in this platform. And this is a big team and uh, I'm just uh, like, you know, I'm just the face of the team who is presenting here because um, uh, as you can imagine, this project has different like, you know, uh, facets and every team members are working and throughout like, you know, different avenues, we are training our students as well. And our students are our uh, driving factor. Without them, we couldn't even like, you know, have uh, come like along this way. So they are motivated because they are from the community. So they are coming to us there and they're saying that we really want to be part of this project. So they're going out there day in, day out. They're talking to their mm -hmm. community. They're getting those resolution passed for us. Then they're going back there to collect yeah. samples. So they are really like, you know, uh, the change makers. And we are really proud of them because uh, they will take it over from us. And that's what the, like, you know, uh, the, broader uh, goal is. And our sponsors, USDOE, uh, Department of Interior, uh, we have NAMOGA, New Mexico Oil and Gas or like an association, and we have uh, uh, Sloan Foundation as well. So in different like you know, aspects, they have supported us uh, so far. Uh, next slide, please. And as I, I'm just telling that I'm just a, like, you know, messenger from our team. So this is only a small part of the team. And this was from last year's uh, symposium. But I, as you can see that, like, you know, uh, many people are working tirelessly uh, to like, you know, make this project successful. And uh, without them, without uh, teamwork like this, we cannot be here after three years. Uh, so next slide. Some of the key contacts of these teams, but I will be happy to like you know share their information with you even after the seminar. Uh, but again, uh, from NTU to NMT to like you know PRRC, PESCO, it's a big team, and the list always keep growing every day. And like you know, uh, uh, I can take your question back to them, and if you want to reach out to any one of the team member, I'll be happy to uh, establish that for you guys. Uh, next slide, please. I think that's the. Last one, and again, thank you everyone for being here. And I would love to take question and my email is there as well. So, and our website is there. Uh, please feel free to like, you know, reach out to us if you have any question and I'll be happy to. Probably I will not have answers for you right now, but I'll, I, I like, you know, we have a team and I will definitely go back to them and get the answers for you guys. So Andrea, I don't know which way, you want to uh, hold this Q&A session, but back to you. Yeah, so thank you so much, Abhishek. That was fantastic. I think in addition to all the great science and technical work, this project is a really nice example of how to partner with the sovereign nation. And there's so many best practices that we can take away from this. So thank you. Um, yeah, so we do have a number of questions in the chat. I'll just start reading them out to you um, how much heat is needed per barrel or gallon and of what temperature or quality and are you generating steam under vacuum all right so uh, the temperature that needs to be like you know uh, so in in our lab setup uh, so we heat them up until 60 degrees celsius so we do not have the number for per barrel uh, yet but our first operation unit will give us those number that has been installed at ntu and uh, no, the heat is not being generated under vacuum, uh, but like, you know, uh, but the steam that we are producing, uh, they are crossing the filter. Great, um, a question from Mark Bebo. Is the water cleanup technology applicable to cleaning up produced water from the oil and gas fields? Answer is yes, and that's how the technology was actually developed. So PRRC, which is petroleum, uh, research and recovery center based on NMT. So they developed this one just for that. And they have like, you know, uh, like you know, great results and uh, using this technology for that. So, but then like, you know, we decided uh, why can we 
treat our nation's groundwater with this technology. So that's how we change our focus from produced water to here. But the answer is yes, and it has been already tested and proven. Okay, and another question from Mark, what happens to the brine resulting from the filtration process? Absolutely, great question. So, unfortunately, Navajo Nation do not have any hazardous waste disposal, like, you know, uh, policy. Yes, that brine is concentrated hazardous waste, but again, remember, we are taking out the, like, you know, water out of that whole, like, you know, system that we are talking about here. So, uh, based on the location of the filtration unit, as Navajo Nation is huge, part is in New Mexico, part is in Arizona. So, we are work, we will be working with the state agencies and then we'll be like, you know, uh, so first of all, the waste will be uh, concentrated and waste will be stored on site until it's like, you know, it's ready to be hauled out. And then we'll be sending it to those state based. Uh, Waste disposal facilities because again, unfortunately, now Nation do not have a uh, uniform uh, hazardous waste handling uh, policy yet. But we we are like you know uh, expecting that throughout this process, probably we can help now our Nation to come up with something. But again, those are like you know down the road stuff. But again, great question. Thank you. Um, a question from Jared Raymond: What's the initial cost, and how often do filters need to be replaced? All right, so uh, just to manufacture the unit, like, you know, based on, so this this can be scaled up and down. So by a 500 gallon per day filtration unit, it costs around 50 to $60,000. And so far we haven't seen any need to change the filters, but again, it can change. As we are uh, like, you know, mentioning that uh, this filter do not clog or foul. And that's why our like, you know, pilot unit will tell us like you know, if that's the case or not. So uh, and that's why the grants like this is really important because we do not want community to pay for anything because that's the first question I get while I'm presenting this project to the community. Do we have to pay for anything? And our answer is no. So we are getting the funding for them to develop this filter, like to manufacture this filter, to deploy and at least first two years of operation so that they don't bear any cost. And even afterwards, when we will be handling the ownership, and again, NTU being part of a, like, you know, member of Navajo Nation will be helping them to get more grant just to operate that. But again, remember, uh, we don't know the true cost yet, and we will be learning from our, like, you know, experiences in the field. So, uh, again, thank you. Okay, another question from Andy Schuler. How does the DCMD process compare to reverse osmosis in terms of energy and production rates? So again, as uh, I just mentioned, like you know, uh, right now when we are using propane, so uh, energy consumption is high. But when we will be switching to solar, the like you know cost is going to go down, and uh, uh, the maintenance is way like you know low than uh, RO and uh, and we and the efficiency is also like you know uh, is really good so but the long term uh, cost and the maintenance and OM we will learn uh, through our this first initial uh, project field deployment okay and uh, Babs Maroney had a question um how does it do with microbial contaminants and groundwater near livestock or is the groundwater too saline for much microbial contamination? Absolutely. So uh, the groundwater is too saline for now for developing any microbial contamination. But on the other hand, once we have the treated water, they're supposed to like, you know, they're supposed to attract microbes, right? So, but there are certain US EPA uh, certified filters already out there, which are very cheap. Uh, you can even buy at Home Depot or Lowe's that are, uh, like, you know, perfect for micro removal. So for now, none of the groundwater that we tested have any type of like, you know, microbial existence, but that will come if we are leaving the filtered water for a long time uh, in the storage tanks. So uh, we, we have some other partners as well. So some NGOs who have funding uh, to buy those filters that are uh, like, you know, uh, capable of microbial removal and they want to partner with us as well so 
we will see how like you know what the need will be down the road so probably we can engage more partners so that the community can have those filter just for microbial removal because those filters are not good for heavy metal or salt removal so our filter might need a like you know that type of filtration unit cheap filtration unit as a polishing step so we already have that in mind but we will see how it plays out uh, down the road Great. Well, those are all the questions we have in the chat. Is there anyone who has other questions they'd like to ask? Feel free to go off of mute or raise your hand. Well, I guess that's it as far as questions go. Um, let me just check the chat one more time. Yeah, well, thank you again, Abhishek. This has been this has been great. Um, we will be sharing your slides on the iWest website, and all that contact information that you provided will be included. So, if anyone wants to reach out, they can. Um, I'm going to quickly just share a little bit of information about our next seminar. Um, please join us on Wednesday, October 18th for. Um, a demo of the energy policy simulator, which is a really, um, it's a great tool that's been developed by energy innovation policy and technology. We'll have Olivia and Rachel be giving us a demo um, and I would encourage you to attend. So with that, um, thank you all for joining and thank you Abhishek again, really appreciate it. Thank you, thank you for hosting me. Yeah, see you all next time. Bye. Thank you.